Let's give a warm welcome to Patty Rose. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, didn't even recognize myself there. That <laughs> I feel like I should die or something because that would be a great uh, <laughs> epitaph, right? Um, thank you so much for inviting me and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. And it might be tomorrow, um, but um, yeah, I, I think it's kind of interesting that a lot of communities are, are choosing to celebrate that rather than Columbus Day, which... It's okay with me. Um, you know, I wanted, before I tell you specifically about uh, the Tribal Youth Media Project, I want to share an anecdote, which uh, is probably one of the most encouraging things I've experienced this year. Um, you're going to hear about this project that three 14-year-old Bad River tribal members put together that has really created a stir out there. Um, and b when we were just beginning the, the process of, uh, of them putting their documentary together, um, I asked the young woman who uh, is the scriptwriter. Uh, and on-camera narrator for this documentary, um, what what she see herself doing um, after high school? And she said, uh, well, I'm supposed to be an auto mechanic. And I didn't say anything at the time, and, you know, this is definitely not a rap <laughs> against auto mechanics. Um, boy, I sure value the one that I have, and it, there's, a, there's a lot of skill involved in that. But it was very typical of what I've observed in communities that have large numbers of Native students who go to non-Indian high schools. Uh, that the Indian kids seem to, on a disproportionate basis, be geared, be, be, be uh, sh steered toward the trades, where the non-Indian kids are really uh, nudged toward pre-college programs. And when, um, when Shania told that to me, um, you know, my, my heart sank a little bit. It didn't say anything to her. Um, it was only her first year of high school, and who knows, you know, what might happen. But I'll tell you, I did backflips when after... Um, this would have been maybe their 10th or 11th screening and maybe their third or fourth big award. Um, at the Green Bay Film Festival, she came up to me and said, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I just signed up for a pre-college program at UW-Stout. And I was, I mean, even now, just sharing that, I've got goosebumps and, you know, it's just what I live for. Now, I don't want you to think that um, I think that her involvement in this project was, you know, the only influence that she experienced that year that made her change her mind. But I think it definitely contributed to her sense of self-worth and I have a voice and I have something to say and I have unlimited potential stretching out in front of me, you know, unlimited paths. And that's why I, I, I was excited about the Tribal Youth Media Initiative when we first started back in 2007. I'm still excited about it today. Um, so before I tell you specifically about TYM, I want to tell you a little bit about the community that um, I've based my work in uh, recently. It's my own reservation. Uh, Bad River, which if you, uh, you know, Wisconsin is shaped like a, like a mitten. <laughs> and if you head north as far as you can, as far as you can go, right before you get wet, stop. That's my reservation, the Bad River Reservation. Um, there are about 4,000 tribal members, 1,000 of whom live on the reservation. It's an area that has really struggled economically. 35% of uh, our population live um, at or below the poverty level. Uh, but that's not to say we're not rich, the way we define it. We are rich because we have one of the most beautiful places on the planet. 71 acres of wetland supporting prime wild rice. 
Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about wild rice uh, from a cultural and spiritual point of view in just a minute. Um, but to tell you a little bit about the topography, uh, south of the reservation um, in this area here, the Pinocchi Hills, uh, we're talking about an 1,800-foot elevation with 22 um, with, with 18 miles of rivers, creeks, brooks, streams, many of which carry outstanding resource waters designations, meaning that they are considered to be so pristine that um, that kicks them into a special level of, of, of protection. Um, one of the issues that you may have been reading about lately is plans for a t uh, initially a four and a half mile long mine, but eventually a 22 mile long line, a mine, um, the stretching uh, from end to end along the Pinocchi Hills, this 1,800 foot upland, uh, and. The Bad River watershed, the, the hydrology and, and geology of the area is such that anything that happens in that upland area drains down through all these uh, rivers and streams and creeks that, that eventually uh, drain into the Bad River, which flows downstream and feeds the, um, the Bad River and Kakagan Sloughs and ultimately drains into Lake Superior. Um, the Ojibwe have an identity that is centered in wild rice, or monomen, the, the good seed, as we call it. And it relates to our oldest stories about um, living here in the Great Lakes region. Then there's a flood. I, now I'm giving you the um, Reader's Digest condensed version. This is a story that takes days to tell. But um, our story uh, goes that we're here in the upper Great Lakes region. There's a flood. The Ojibwe people move east to, uh, and live along the shores of the Great Salt Sea for such a long time that we forget our way home. And then there's a crisis and if there's time, I'll tell you what I think that crisis was. Um, and people start visioning and fasting and praying, as people do. And a prophecy is revealed that the people need to return to their to our original homes, um, or will be destroyed. And the, as the prophecy continues, the people will remember seven stopping places that will lead them back to our original homes where the food grows on water. And some of those stopping places are, um, are pretty obvious, a place of thundering water, Niagara Falls, a place where um, the river cuts through the landscape like a knife, the Detroit River, a place of really shallow water where the fish are so plentiful you can almost walk across their backs, um, that Sault Ste. Marie. And so these stopping places are described um, quite vividly in this migration story. And it uh, and we'll, as the prophecy reveals, um, we'll know where we're going because there's there will be a mega shell that will reveal itself to the people, um, and by following the the mega shell will appear and disappear and appear and disappear, and, and at the end of that process, we'll be back at the uh, place where the food grows on water. So, as the Anishinaabe, our word for ourselves, um, which includes the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa people followed those stopping places, it ultimately led us back to the south shore of Lake Superior where we found wild rice. And so for the Ojibwe people, wild rice is not just a, a food staple, not just a, a source of economic sustenance because it was a trade item, um, but it is really the manifestation of the covenant uh, we have with our creator. And so um, it's at the center of all of our ceremonies. It's, it's really just at the center of, of everything. It's our identity. And the children with whom I worked grew up in that, um, in that environment. And two of the children uh, are members of families that 
very much live close to the land, um, going out each summer, uh, late summer, and harvesting the wild rice. Um, Shania is a, a ricer. Abene, who did the music for the program, is a ricer. Um, their families are, are very much traditional kinds of families. So um, we started the Tribal Youth Media Initiative with a Baldwin grant back in 2007. And Tim Tynan, who's in the audience, uh, was my original co-conspirator. Um, and we started actually at the Lacoudere Reservation. And, uh, and then in 2012, we moved to the Bad River Reservation. Um, and I'm going to come back to the, the, the media project that came out of that 2012, um, 2013 uh, effort funded by the First Peoples Fund because that that was a, a pretty amazing experience. But um, I hope I think we're losing a little bit of the of the slide. But uh, we have ad ad adopted uh, what we call an organic video approach, OVA, and it's it's really it really reflects bottoms up planning. Uh, in the spring, we meet with elders. Um, on the reservations in which we work, and we ask the elders, what do you want us to teach your kids? What do you want them to learn? And so they identify the, the, um, the issues, the natural resource issues, and in the past that's been climate change, water quality, um, uh, the effort to restore wild rice uh, on the Chippewa flowage, um, what else do we, climate change, climate change, water quality, oh, spearfishing, treaty rights. Um, and then at Bad River, uh, the, the community has such tremendous anxiety about this mine that that issue dominates all others. Um, but it, which is not to say that, that tribal members there aren't concerned about other environmental issues. Um, especially when it comes to climate change. That, that's an issue that is really weighing heavily on people. Um, and and it's, they're already starting to s believe that climate change is stressing the rice. And so when they think about a mine threat, you know, an immediate, there, there's, there's so many different threats to the rice between invasive species, which may or may not be attached to climate change, um, man-made pollution, mercury, acid rain, all those things, weather issues. You know, the rice is a very fragile plant, and it's extremely susceptible to changing um, fluctuations, to water fluctuations. Uh, so when there's an event like, um, you know, if you remember a couple of years back, there was a tremendous storm that came through Duluth and there were there were pictures on the national news of otters in the street you know f floating around the um, the storm drains um, it was a tremendous event that create that created hardship for the city of Duluth but that absolutely devastated the rice in Bad River which is just an hour east of there so um, there are all these different threats and then the, the mine threat on top of it is just you know, you can imagine the anxiety that um, that people are feeling. So, this is we get our we we get our direction from the elders. Um, we try to work within the cultural protocols that exist on that uh, in that particular reservation. Um, in many cases, among the Ojibwe, it's elder epistemology. Knowledge transfer happens intergenerationally, so uh, we understand that elders are an important part of teaching young people, and so um, they are involved from from day one. The other thing that that we we try to respect is the fact that um, Native kids are much more comfortable learning from a position of observation and rote as opposed to um, more analytical thinking. Not that they can't think analytically, but they're used to 
being next to an older person and having the person demonstrate how to do something and then repeating it to the point where a child is comfortable and, and learns um, to take the step to doing that him or herself. Um, we also know that Native kids, and I'm not sure... You know, I, I don't have a background in pedagogy, but I'm not sure that all kids don't learn better visually and spatially than textually. Um, but we, from experience, we know that our kids want to see pictures of things. And so when we teach camera techniques, there's a big picture of a camera with the on-off button. And, you know, here, it flips down to this position. Everybody look at your camera and let's all do it together. And here's how you put the battery in. And there's a big picture of that section of the camera with the battery. So we really emphasize um, visual and, and spatial learning. Um, and from a, from a theoretical perspective, um, we really have borrowed from Erica Halverson's model of thinking about youth, about adolescence, not at a time of risk, but as a time of opportunity. Um, let's not think about how these, these young people are limited. Let's think about what they're able to do and try to create a nurturing environment so that they can, um, they can be successful, whatever it is. In our case, it's be successful at telling a story. Um, in addition to meeting the elders, we also then meet with the, you know, the youth and say, what do you want to learn? How do you want to learn it? What, do you, what kind of technologies are you interested in learning? And um, it's, it's amazing. I, um, the last conversation that I had with a group of high schoolers at Ashland High School just this spring, you know, they want to do cooking shows. They want to do chopped, you know, but they don't want anybody to be booted off because that's not very, they just, they want to reward somebody, they want to use traditional um, foods and do cooking competitions, but nobody gets booted off. It's just, yeah, you know, one team may win and get bragging rights, but nobody, you know, it's, it's very tribal in that sense. Um, uh, they, want to, they want to design their own video games and what's really interesting is when, I, when we met with elders, they were saying, you know, we really would love to, to, um, to have somebody uh, teach our kids about medicines and be able, we want them to know, we want them to be able to identify uh, medicinal plants and it would be great if they could know the name in uh, Ojibwe Moen, our, our uh, traditional language. Um, and, and, and know what they were traditionally used for. So fast forward to my little focus group at Ashland High School with kids, and you know, I'm showing them how students are using ARIS. Some of you may be familiar with ARIS. It's a program, a video learning game that was developed right here at Wisconsin. It's being used all over the world. And I'm showing them you know, uh, stories about kids that have de designed their own video games. And I said, you know, what do you think? Would this be something that you might be interested in? And it was just uncanny because one of them said, you know, it would be really cool if we did a game where we, we showed like traditional plants and if you click, if you, you could click a button and it would tell you the name, uh, you know, in Ojibwe and you could click another button, you could hear it in, in English and, and, and maybe there was a way you could click it and it would take you to an interview with, you know, like somebody's grandma that was talking. And I'm thinking this is, there's so much synergy. Both generations want the same things. One is thinking, you know, in more traditional terms, the other is thinking about new high-tech ways to promote the same thing. So this is when it gets really exciting for me. And one of the things that I thought um, was particularly interesting is that elders this past year were telling us they were thinking about the mind and they were framing it within the context of seventh generation philosophy. And for those of you that may not be familiar with it, this is a traditional teaching that that's, and, and it's not just the Ojibwe that have it. You see it reflected by a lot of tribes. But in our way, um, seventh generation means that when you sit down to make an important decision, you think about how that decision is going to affect 
your children and grandchildren and great grandchildren 240 years, you know, seven generations into the future, 240 years. And it makes a difference then whether you, um, you know, plant an oak or plant a, tr a pine tree. Uh, I think if you pull that forward and think about it in terms of personal responsibility, um, if I'm a business person, I'm not going to knowingly contaminate this particular stream or river if I know that my children or my grandchildren were going to be the ones that were drinking from it. Or I'm not going to, you know, maybe I don't act a certain way because I would be embarrassed if my children or grandchildren found out that I was responsible for something. So, you know, it's, it's a really interesting philosophy. And um, the elders told us that, that they are thinking about the mind in terms of this. And then when we met with um, the kids, they were doing um, cloud planning and, uh, and decided that what they wanted to do was organize their documentary around the principle of seventh generation philosophy, which I thought was pretty interesting given that their elders were thinking along the same lines. And so here's an excerpt from, um, from that documentary. It's the very first thing you see in the documentary. It sort of sets the stage for what comes after. In the way that our ancestors thought was to look at the bigger picture of everything but not only what was directly in front of us and around us, but what was far into the future. And part of that is looking at the seventh generation ahead. And every generation does that. My generation will do that. Your generation will do that. Uh, the past generations have done that for me. I don't uh, approve of any degradation to our mother, the earth. Nimama Kinan is the word. And Nimama Kinan takes care of us. And we know from the beginning of time that as long as we took care of her, she would take care of us. And today, society is changing so much that they're forgetting that where everything comes from and that they're they're looking at something totally different from what the earth provides and not seeing that in the destroying the earth so significantly we are destroying the people we've We've been working with these kids for quite a few years um, at, from middle school on and teaching them in addition to helping to, to nurture their sense of storytelling and, and trying to empower them, giving them a voice. We've also spent a lot of time teaching them the technical tools and the aesthetics in this documentary are just amazing. Um, and what, what I thought was so interesting when I, um, when I first met up with these uh, three veterans of our middle school program and worked with them on this project, I said uh, to the videographer who shot every single frame of video for this himself, uh, it was amazing. I, I, truly, I've worked with professional photographers that had less of a sense of video aesthetics than this 14-year-old boy. Um, but... Um, I said, hey, Jordan, how you doing? He goes, rule of thirds, rule. I said, um, what do you know? Hi, Jordan, what do you know? And he goes, rule of thirds, rule of thirds. <laughs> Has that, that sense of video aesthetics uh, in framing. And you saw that in the, the frame of the elder that, uh, that he, who he interviewed. Um, all right. Uh, so the way we um, approach it is uh, our kids uh, research in Everything. Um, in this case, the documentary that I've been featuring here that, that was put together in 2013, they researched history, um, culture, ecology, 
geology, there's a, there's a STEM component to this. They interviewed a, a geologist from uh, Northland College, and there's a whole section on rocks and how the mine, you know, the, the different layers of rocks that, that the mining company has to drill through and that one of those layers contains pyrite. And so they're making the connection between sulfide deposits and sulfuric acid when air and water come into contact with it. And this Northland professor is explaining, you know, hydrology and geology to them, and some basic chemistry. Um, and they were, they decided who they were going to interview. Um, in, one, in the case of the hydrologist, they actually wanted to interview their sixth grade science teacher who happened to be on vacation for an extended period of time. And so the Northland College professor was the he, he was their second choice, but he did, <laughs> Tom Fitz, if any of you know him, did a really fine jo job. Um, they produced it themselves. They shot it. Um, like I said, Jordan Principato composed every single shot himself. Um, and, and, well, maybe I'll, I'll, another story that I may share with you if there's time. Um, they wrote it themselves. Shania Jackson wrote uh, everything. She did the on-camera narration. And let me tell you, for a native girl, um, this was really tough because as Tim, well, he's nodding. Um, from our earliest experience, we found that even in the fifth grade, which is the, um, the age group that we first started working with, um, there were, there were, somehow, Native girls had already determined what were appropriate gender-specific roles. It was really, it was pretty, um, uh, pretty disappointing. You know, do you want to shoot? Oh no, that's a boy's job. You know, and they're 11 years old. But what was really interesting, <laughs> I should tell that story about um, about this little group of girls that I wound up working with, uh, our, maybe our first year of working with with kids, and. Um, I asked who wanted to be the writer and who wanted to sh do the shooting and who wanted to be the editor. And um, none of the girls wanted to shoot because, um, as one told told us, you know, that's a boy's job. I don't want to do that. And part of it, I think, was because these cameras that we were using were so intimidating. They were professional video cameras. And it wasn't until, you know, we used all those pictures, close-up pictures of, okay, Here's how you turn it on. Here's how you do this. Here, and as and as kids began to feel more comfortable, then we had the problem of everybody in this group of girls that I was working with then wanted to do videography, and so you know that was fine. But my favorite story: one of the one of the girls came up to me, and she was once she got past the it's a boy's job concept. Um, she was absolutely addicted to shooting video. That's all she wanted to do. And she always had this big camera hanging over her hip. And um, she came up to me a couple of days into the camp and said, um, where's Cheryl? I can't find Cheryl. And I'm, you know, looking at my clipboard thinking, oh my gosh, I've lost a camper. You know, I'm a little bit sued. <laughs> Cheryl, Cheryl, I don't see a Cheryl. I'm like, and I said, Cheryl, Cheryl, who? And she said, Cheryl, the camera. I named her Cheryl. <laughs> Which, <laughs> and naming is actually kind of a big thing in Indian country. It's you know, um, it's we have ceremony naming ceremonies, and and uh, Rand Valentine tells this delightful story of trying to do um, an Ojibwe vocabulary with with some really ancient ladies up in a very northern Ojibwe community in Canada and first he has to you know they're all in their 80s and he's having to teach them how to do basic um, word processing and so you know that in addition to doing the vocabulary stuff it was here's how you work a computer okay everybody point their cursor at file okay open the open the file and give it a name and he said you know, 20 minutes later, everybody was, you know, <laughs> with their hands on the, on the computers, you know, just, you know, thinking about, oh, give this a name. <laughs> You're laughing, right? All right, so um, anyway, so Cheryl the camera, 
was just a little indication of how attached this young girl was to her camera that she gave her a name. Um, all right, so research, uh, produce, um, shooting, writing, narrating, editing, they did that themselves. Um, uh, they did the paper editing. Uh, we had kind of an advanced video program, and so they would tell me what they wanted, and I pushed the buttons. You know, that was my role. Um, but I didn't tell them what to do. They told me what to do, and, then, and, and I did it. And then presenting um, at community film festivals, conferences. I think, um, I think yours is number 31. Wow. Yes, wow. In, um, in a year and a half. 31 film festivals and conferences, and um, what was uh, one of the highlights was the 2014 Human Rights Film Festival in, at Arizona State University um, chose this film, Protect Our Future, as a centerpiece film and built um, not just a screening, but a session with a uh, with, with professors and um, a session with high school students, uh, their peers, around it. So it was really exciting and, and um, the kids did a fabulous job. Um, so some of the things that, uh, that they pointed out in their, their video um, was how extraordinary, um, and this is a little background on this issue, um, and maybe why so many environmental organizations and film festivals have wanted to screen it, uh, not just because it's an important issue, but of course because of the unique perspective of, of youth. Um, uh, the Kakagan Slough was recently added to the list of um, the Ramsar list of 35 critically important wetlands of international importance, um, the outstanding resource waters, uh, one of the most significantly ecologically, or one of the most ecologically significant places on the planet, and that's from the Nature Conservancy. And, and really, one of the things that came out in the documentary that the kids wanted to share was that this isn't just a place that's important for Bad River, but it's important for everybody in northern Wisconsin and really the entire state. Um, all right, so... Uh, the point was made quite a bit in the documentary that um, if you know, if you've ever been to Copper Falls State Park, this Tyler Forks, this is a picture of Tyler Forks, which is just uh, a, not even a, a two or three miles away from it, but they wanted to let people know that it was going to, that the landscape was going to transform from this to this. And um, and so the, this next little excerpt, um, and I noticed the intermezzo-like music that was com that our 15-year-old music composer composed for this. It was pretty dramatic and dark. Everyone here is concerned about a large open pit taconite mine they want to build just south of our reservation. It is in the Pinocchio Hills where there are lots of streams and rivers. The Ojibwe signed three treaties in the 1800s. We were forced to give up land that eventually became northern Wisconsin, but in the ceded territory, we reserved the right to hunt, fish, and gather. We have treaty rights in the, uh, in the uh, ceded territories. And the uh, Pinocchio Ridge uh, lies well within the ceded territories. We have the right to hunt, to fish, and to gather in those territories ceded to the United States. And if those ecosystems, if those plants, uh, those animals, if that water is threatened in any way, we have uh, legal recourse. 
So um, the documentary the kids put together last year really um, looked at science, but it also looked at traditional ecological knowledge. It looked at the spiritual, cultural, and economic um, issues that are raised by the mine. And, uh, and it was, the community has been so proud of the work of their young people. It's had a couple of screenings on the reservation. But what it was really what what was really gratifying about it uh, for a lot of people was the fact that it connected the young people and the elders. Um, it also has been used as an educational tool. Um, the tribe made uh, 500 copies of this and has been sending it out to schools and environmental groups and legislators um, trying to explain um, what taconite is because the kids also, I mean, it was, it's kind of a public education tool as well. Um, that, you know, taconite's a low grade. Iron ore, for those of you that don't know much about it, it's uh, we're talking about large scale mining. Um, I think the you know if you think about our flag, our state flag, it's got a picture of a farmer and a miner shaking hands, and the the image that most people have when they think about mining is grandpa with a little pickaxe over his shoulder and a shaft mine somewhere, and this is not that kind of mining um, because taconite is such a low grade iron ore, it's like between 12 and 18 percent iron, um, they have to do mining on a large scale. There's a huge footprint with this kind of mining. It's mountaintop removal, it's open pit, um, you know, 22 miles long, mile and a half wide, 1,500 to 2,000 feet deep. And that that earlier uh, video that was shown, what was lifted from the documentary, is uh, from an actual um, taconite mine, open pit taconite mine in Hibbing, Minnesota, which is um, only three miles long. So the the mine that we're talking about at Bad River is infinitely much much well not infinitely but much much bigger. Um, we also know that uh, about a hundred miles south, downstream of uh, the taconite mine in Minnesota, uh, all the wild rice has been killed. It, there is no rice anymore in the St. Louis River. And it's considered enough of a problem that the state of Minnesota is currently um, rewriting its uh, sulfide, sulfate levels uh, on rice lakes. Um, so these are some of the things that the kids uh, wanted to talk about. Um, and because it's so large scale, because uh, the, the, my, the, the, the taconite represents such a small percentage of, of the iron in a rock, the stripping rate is, is pretty considerable. You know, you have to mine one, for every one unit of, of iron you generate, you've got three, four, it kind of depends on where, you know, what rock you're, you're, um, you're mining at that particular time, but the stripping rate can be anywhere from one to one to one to five, meaning that you're generating five times as much waste as you are actual iron ore. So, um, uh, other other environmental concerns, um, you know, the sulfide drilling through the sulfide deposits, and this was something that um, Tom Fitz, the geologist at North College, uh, covered during the um, during his interview. The fact that this will generate sulfuric acid, and um, that could be a problem. Um, the volume of tailings. Um, one of the researchers for Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission was talking about the difficulties of where to put these tailing piles, that they're going to be going now because of the, the changes in our environmental laws, um, the, those tailings of waste rock uh, piles can be put anywhere, as long as it's not on a federally protected wetlands list, it, it can go anywhere. Um, Air emissions, uh, that was uh, a problem. Uh, um, the mine would require more power, uh, double the current capacity of the Ashland power plant. And then um, water quality issues. Uh, this picture here, uh, 
Our videographer um, carried, uh, this is a Pinocchio Hills education group that walked five miles uphill uh, and back um, for a, a tour of, of where they were mining. And um, there's our little 14-year-old videographer carrying all this equipment, trudging uphill with them, walked the whole distance and documented their, their walk. Um, so it, you know, it, and, and Jordan celebrated his uh, 14th birthday uh, with us, and so we, we did the only reasonable thing. We buried him in the sand. Uh, <laughs> but it really was a, a, a collaborative effort. Um, the kids chose who they wanted to interview. Uh, the, the, everybody that appeared in the documentary, uh, this is un, and this is different than what most journalism would look like. Everybody that appeared in the film got a copy of it before it was shared publicly. And um, they could comment on it and say, oh, I didn't like this, or I wish I would have said that. And then the kids re-edited it. So um, that was a little bit different than the kind of journalism you would see in mainstream. It uh, had, um, it, it premiered down here at the Tales from Planet Earth Film Festival. Um, and they turned away almost 60 or 70 people. Um, it was amazing, that, that room. Um, held, I think, 300 people, and there were people that were turned away, so that was really exciting. And then um, it, it premiered up in northern Wisconsin, the Big Water F Film Festival, and um, uh, <gasps> city between Bayfield and Ashland, because of the W. What? Washburn. 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 Um, and then at other places, Green Bay Film Festival. And, um, and it's been shown really all over the country now. And uh, it's uploaded to YouTube. I'm going to show you the link in just a minute. Um, it's the tribe created DVDs, um, which it's distributing to environmental groups and political organizations, lawmakers. I think the fact that it was created by children gives it a unique appeal. And um, I think the, the tribe has recognized that. So if you um, if you go to YouTube, here's the link, and I realize that's you know it's kind of tough to write down. But if you go to YouTube and Google "Protect Our Future" and my name, you'll you'll wind up um, at that site, and it really is a pretty extraordinary documentary. And with that, we've got about ten minutes left, and I'd be happy to answer questions or hear your comments.